Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on binary analysis. Uh, I am Jinnad Harun Siddiqui from Lums University, Pakistan, and I'll be the session chair for this session. And we have three presentations scheduled in this session. Uh, we have uh, our student volunteers, Hefe Kirsi and Fahim Mehmand. Thanks for them. They will help us during the sessions. And if you have any questions, use the Slack link for this session and post your questions there. I'll ask the questions to the presenters at the end of their presentation. So let's start with the first presentation. The first presentation is patch-based vulnerability matching for binary programs. And this will be a video presentation by Yifei Shou. So uh, can the volunteers start the presentation? Hello, everyone. I'm Xu Yifei from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. Today, my topic is patch-based vulnerability matching for binary programs. This presentation will introduce the following aspects. The background. Vulnerability whose patch has been released is called as one-day vulnerability, as known as known vulnerability. It would be exploited to attack the users who fail to adopt the latest security patches. Many studies and reports have pointed out the threats of known vulnerabilities. For one-day vulnerabilities detection in binary programs, the binary level code matching has been considered as a good solution. It compares the similarity between functions with known vulnerabilities and target functions in a given binary executable. If a target function is similar to a known vulnerable function, it will be predicted as vulnerable. However, it is difficult for the current function matching solutions to differentiate vulnerable and patched functions, since patches usually introduce subtle changes to fix vulnerabilities. The patched functions would be identified as vulnerable, resulting in high false positive rates in detecting vulnerabilities. We take a motivating example. We use a hard blade bug in OpenSSL as a running example. It occurs in function DTLS1, process heartbeat. Figure A shows the control flow graph of the vulnerable function, and figure B shows the CFJ of the patched function. The patch adds a check in the source code, which results in few basic blocks added and changed in the CFG, as the orange blocks in the figure A and B. The other blocks in two functions are still the same. The definition of changed basic block, boundary basic block, and unchanged basic block are shown here. Given an unknown binary ex uh, executable, which may contain this function, we want to know whether the hard bleed bug exists or not. If a traditional function matching approach is, is adopted and the vulnerable function in figure A is used as matching target, the corresponding function in the unknown binary may be matched. For instance, the patched function in figure B can be matched, since they share a large number of common blocks with the same structure, which may cause the false positive. How to distinguish between vulnerable function and patched function with a high similarity in binary program becomes a big challenge. To the best of our knowledge, there lacks an effective and efficient approach for binary level vulnerable matching with patch identification. Moreover, an approach to be practical for real world projects need to meet three properties. The approach needs to be a current uh, accurate in identifying the patches in the target function. That is, it's necessary to distinguish between target functions with high similarity. The approach needs to be scalable for large real-world programs. That is, it is necessary to ensure that the analysis overhead cannot be excessive. And the approach should use no information from the source code to work in closed source program binaries. That is, it should complete analysis without source code information. X3 is designed to address this problem. Its goal is to uh, differentiate patched functions from vulnerable functions by identifying patch 
uh, presences so that vulnerable functions can be identified with a low false positive rate. It contains three main steps as target function matching, patch signature generation, and patch princess identification. I'll introduce them one by one. Given a target program, a vulnerable function, and its patched function, in order to reduce the time consumption, we first narrow down the searching scope by locating target functions in the target program that are similar to vulnerable function, on which the patch uh, presence identification is pro, uh, performed. We use a uh, syntactic and the structural information of functions to construct the a function signature and check whether two functions are similar or not. This can achieve a high uh, uh, accuracy to identify the target functions because the, vulner uh, the vulnerable function are usually large, whose syntactic and structural information are rich and unique, which allows, uh, which allows us to uh, uh, differentiate them from other functions. Remark that this target function matching is not the contribution of this work. Hence, it may be similar to other existing approaches. Then we generate patch signature. We first apply the binary instruction normalization to reduce the compiler introduced changes, including address, memory, and register normalization. The next step is uh, basic block mapping. Basic block mapping tries to map the same basic blocks between two functions. It is a technique to compute differences uh, of the functions in which unmatched blocks are regarded as the differences. These differences will be used to construct patch signatures. There are basic block uh, mapping algorithms in literature such as BingDiff and Delphra. They use the hash value of the uh, basic blocks to perform the mapping. However, if there are several, several duplicated blocks in one function that have the same hash value, they may fail to match the block with a, a correct one. We use a novel mapping algorithm, which considers the contest information of the basic block to avoid different blocks happen to have same contents to be mapped. Then, being X-ray will perform valid trace generation. Based on the basic block mapping results between vulnerable function and patched function, it locates all the CBBs of these two functions and identifies the boundary basic blocks for each CBB. A valid trace is a sequence of a, a con consecutive basic blocks that starts and ends with some a BBB across at least one CBB without any loops. This tree carries semantic information related to the vulnerability. To build the VT, we put all the CBBs and the BBBs into one connected graph. All the BBBs are the root and the leaf nodes of the graph, and the CBBs are internal nodes. The valid trees are all the positive passes in the graph. BX3 generates two sets of VTs for the vulnerable function and patched function, which are regarded as the patch signature. The advantage of constructing the VTs as patch signature is twofold. First, it pinpoints changes induced by vulnerability patching, reduce the influence of noisy basic blocks. For example, this figure shows a target function, a vulnerable function, and a patched function. As we can see, the vulnerability is fixed by adding two blocks in area 2. However, some changes which are not related to the vulnerability occur in area 1. According to the boundary basic blocks, BX3 can locate the related blocks in area 2 in target functions and exclude, and exclude the changes induced by noisy blocks in area 1. Second, it reduces the number of basic blocks and the traces used in signature generation and the patch presences identification. As we just take CBBs and BBBs into consideration instead of the whole function. Now let's start with the uh, last, is, last step, patch princess identification. 
This figure shows the relationship between valid tree sets. Each tree set represents the unique parts related to the vulnerability in the corresponding function. T1 and T2 are patch signature mentioned above, as mentioned above. T3 and T4 represent the dif uh, differences between TF and VF. T5 and T6 represent the differences between TF and PF. The generation of these tree sites are similar to the patch signature generation. Getting CBBs through function diffing and combining CBBs with BBBs from patch signature to generate VTs. And being X ray will, uh, element, uh, will eliminate irrelevant trees in tree size T4 and T6. And we can get the reduced tree size T41 and T62. The X ray performs patch. Uh, presency identification by calculating the similarity score between tree sets and patch signature. BX ray first compute similarity score for each pair of trees uh, from the two tree sites. BX ray first connect the basic blocks in the trees to form sequential instruction traces, then compare them to uh, obtain the similarity score. The score is computed. Uh, is compu computed, uh, computed according to the first equation. After having individual score of each pair of traces, the final similarity between two trace sets is computed according to the second equation. We propose a decision algorithm to determine whether a target function has been patched or not. The core idea of this algorithm is to infer the relationship of functions by leveraging the similarity of their differences. It is more accurate in dealing with partial similarity program. There will be three cases, and the bin X-ray completes the decision through the similarity relationship between the valid tree sets. Tree sets. Now we will do some evaluation of the bin X-ray. There are four research questions need to be answered, and we will design experiments to answer them. Uh, for experiment setup, we choose to collect vulnerabilities from widely used libraries with CVE identifiers, including 12 different real-world libraries across different domains. Uh, we extract necessary public CVE information, and we download the source code of target program, compile them into binary executables using GCC with default optimizations uh, as O2, and then dump the binary code of the function using the binary disassembler IDA Pro. For each function with a CVE, uh, we save two versions its vulnerable and the patched versions, respectively. For each CVE, the changed function before the patch commit are considered as vulnerable, and the functions after the patch commit are considered as patched, and we regard this as the ground truth. Uh, we first do the accuracy evaluation. The results on the real-world programs show that BX3 can effectively identify the patch in the target function. It has on average more than 93% accuracy in predicting the patch princess and more than 96% accuracy in identifying CVEs. About the performance evaluation, uh, BX3 is very uh, efficient, which can make prediction less than 300 uh, milliseconds per function on average. Now we compare being x ray to related works. Uh, we use the open SSL data sites to test Bingo E, uh, a state of art function matching tool. As we can see, being x ray has a much lower false positive rate with a reasonable low false negative rate, and it takes half of the time to make prediction on one function. As for patch identification works, BX3 has a slightly better performance than Faber in terms of uh, accuracy. It is much faster than Faber, and the BX3 don't require source code information. Uh, some uh, useful applications of BX3 by identifying function tags with uh, which are changes across 
different versions. Uh, Bing X ray can precisely identify the binary version, and we have used Bing X ray to search the vulnerabilities in seven real world IoT devices firmwares and that contain open SSL library. Bing X ray successfully identifies that 49 vulnerabilities have been patched and 48 vulnerabilities still remain in those firmwares. And the more experimental data can be found at our website. Uh, Bing X ray has some uh, Laminations. Uh, so there are some future work can be done. Bing X-ray currently does not support cross architecture uh, patch detection. Uh, in the future, we plan to use uh, inter uh, mid uh, intermediate uh, rep representation to lift the binary instruction to higher level to support the cross architecture uh, comparison. And BX ray is not able to handle the case where a function receives multiple changes changes at the same location in different versions. A positive a possible solution is to use info, uh, interfunction semantic analysis to find the root case of the vulnerability and check whether the problem has been addressed or not. Uh, however, a heavy program analysis will significantly decrease the performance. Therefore, we need to design algorithms to make trade-off between the performance and the accuracy. That's all. Thanks for listening, and the questions are welcome. Thank you, uh, Yifei, for the uh, thank you, Yifei, for the talk. And if there are any questions, you can post them on Slack. And uh, meanwhile, I can start with some questions. And you did answer one of my questions that I was thinking about that what happens if there are subsequent changes in the repository, subsequent patches. And I think that's a, that's a challenge. And if you can comment more on that. And also I was thinking you mentioned about O2. Uh, so what happens if O3 or different uh, uh, optimization levels are used? Okay, so to answer the question like here, first one, the multiple changes in the same location. And we designed being X-ray to uh, to handle the case where like uh, if a function has been patched or has been changed in uh, multiple times, and but the location is different, like some change in the function beginning, some things in the end, the being X-ray is able to find it. But we do face some case like where like uh, a, function is being changed in the same location, the same, actually the same statement, like it changed twice or th three times. But in this case, we, we don't have any like a good solution for that because like uh, the semantics will keep changing. Like uh, we only can snapshot one time, like uh, with by uh, comparing the patch and the vulnerable functions to get the signatures. So the signature is a one, uh, is a one in one time short and uh, so it can only last for a certain period, like after several versions late or several versions before, uh, the uh, semantics may not be able to find the, to make a good decision, a correct decision. And for the second question, like it, we, we compile our binary and do the experiment for O2. And uh, if we are uh, using a different optimization levels, the same, uh, the same, we still get the same result, but the problem is like we are, we are trying to use O0, which is no optimization, and we uh, compare with O3, we've, uh, we found that the performance will decrease because like uh, the semantics is changed a lot and we cannot find like uh, the same, like same base blocks in, uh, in the same functions. So like uh, uh, when we generate all the different ch traces, in a one function, we will face like uh, there are uh, thousands of like traces we, will, we may get out of like a uh, hundred uh, uh, hundred basic block functions that will like uh, affect our performance a lot. And sometimes like it may uh, like affect uh, prediction uh, accuracy. So we are thinking of using semantic 
like uh, analysis, like program analysis to solve this problem, but we didn't put in, uh, we may improve this tool in the future, I think. Thank you, Yufei. <clears throat> That's uh, very wonderful for the wonderful presentation and the, for the wonderful work. We'll now move on to the next talk. Uh, it's identifying Java calls in native code via binary scanning. And it is another video presentation by George Fortunus. Can we have the video, please? Hello, I'm George Fortunis, and I will be presenting how to find callbacks from native code to Java code by scanning binaries for strings. This is joint work with Leonidas Trendafilou and Jens Maragalakis from the University of Athens. Java programs are supposed to be platform independent, and the whole platform is geared towards platform independence. However, many programs in Java still contain native code. In Andalusia, a survey by Almani et al. found that 540 out of 600 top free applications in the Google Play Store contain native libraries, an average of eight libraries per application. This native code is a problem because Java static analysis tools cannot understand it. And in a recent survey by Sui et al., it was found that this is a core threat in call graph analysis. In particular, we find that in Android, in Android development, applications may not be successfully optimized or obfuscated if they miss callbacks from native code. This work is about detecting such callbacks from native code to Java code, and the result is fixing unsoundness in the computation of reachable methods in the program. While doing so, we also inform call graph analysis where possible. A key feature of our technique is that it's lightweight. We try to avoid having two big analyses, one running on the Java part of the program and one on the other, and having some way to somehow combine the results. We have a Java analysis, and we start from the strings found in the binaries, and we proceed from there and try to find the callbacks. Native code in Java follows the Java native interface specification. The Java Native Interface, or JNI, gives an API that can be used by native code to interact with Java. Here we find an example. We find a function implemented in C, and this function finds a class, hello JNI here, finds a method, hello method is the name, and here is the low-level JVM signature, calls the method, which will give back an integer, and prints that number on screen. We have found that usually strings are used here and constant strings in particular. These strings exist even in the compiled form of the library. So if we take the compiled library and run a tool to find the strings, we'll find them. And we can classify these strings as either names or signatures. Our key insight is that forming a product of these names times the signatures will give us a superset of the callbacks, and then we only have to filter that set to improve precision and be smart about the actual results used. When we have these callbacks, we can also work further with the JNI specification to determine the missed call graph edges. The first problem that we encounter is just taking the product of all the string names in the binary and all the string signatures is too big. It leads to a very imprecise uh, result because the superset of actual callbacks is way bigger than what we need. So it gives us too many false positives because many strings are mistaken for actual method names like read and write strings may match a serializable methods, for example. To fix this problem and improve precision, we don't create one big product for the whole library, but we create 
one small product for every function. So we look at every function in the binary and we find the names and the signatures used in that function and we form a product there. This is done by using Radar2, a very strong reverse engineering tool that gives us back function boundaries and also string references used inside the functions. And there we can know that we have very precise small sets that all together gives us give us the big picture of the callbacks. Of course, analyzing binaries for function boundaries is something that doesn't always work. And sometimes native code is too hostile to analyze. So here, for some problematic native code, we may not be able to do this filtering. The second problem is callbacks to constructors. When native code calls a constructor, it's to allocate something in the native part of the program. And native allocations, as found by Sui et al. recently, are a major source of unsoundness. Our problem is that constructors are all named in it, in bytecode. Only their signatures differ, and this introduces a lot of unsoundness and generates too many false positives. Here, we try to be smart and apply a precision heuristic that says we will accept a constructor only if its class is used in some other way, if a field is written, for example, or if a method is invoked. To reason about fields, we must have a points to analysis, and to reason about invoked methods, we must have a call graph analysis. So, where do we find this analysis, and how do we integrate with them? In practice, we chose DOOP, which is a static analysis framework where analysis are written in data log, and they are written in a way that they work together in a mutually recursive fashion by each analysis, by consuming and generating data from the other analysis. And let me explain more about this, uh, the way that analysis combine together in DOOP. So in the left part of the screen, we see two standard analysis, a call graph analysis and a points to analysis. And we have arrows between them, pointing both directions, because these two analysis are mutually recursive. Each uncovers more code for the other to work with. On the right hand, we have our filtering for constructors. It's an actual snippet from Doop. You don't have to read it all. Uh, just uh, look at the highlighted parts. The yellow part is what we compute as an accepted constructor callback. The blue parts come from the analysis. So, in the upper part, you see that the constructor is supposed to be a callback from native code if some other instance method is reachable. This information comes from the call graph analysis. In the bottom, we see that if a field is used, then a constructor is also considered a callback, and this field information also comes from the points to analysis. But on the last line, we see that we also contribute to the reachability information. We also make the constructor a reachable method, so we inform the call graph analysis. This is a complex pattern of mutual recursion, and having the data log part of dupe do that automatically is really helpful. Now, another problem is that so far we have talked about reachability. We say that we detect a native callback, so we mark the Java method as reachable. That, that's fine for fixing unsoundness and reachability, but we would also like to fix unsoundness in call graph analysis. What if the native code is behind a native Java method? Shouldn't we form a, an edge from the original method to the final method, even though it's called uh, via the native code? To do that, we must know how native methods in Java correspond to functions in native libraries how libraries are linked against Java. 
And to do that, we have to model JNI linking to be able to reason about entry points to native code from specific entry points in Java. JNI linking comes in two flavors, an automatic one and the configurable one. And the automatic one is easy, almost trivial. If you have some package with a class and method, you know what name is to be expected and automatically linked against the Java code. There's an optional signature suffix in case of uh, overloaded methods, but that's it. So if your JNI code respects this convention, you're fine. However, there's also the case of configurable JNI linking. Here, the JNI API gives the developer the capability to link arbitrary function pointers to native Java methods. Look here on the right side where we see an excerpt from uh, an existing Android application, the Android Terminal Emulator, and we, he we see here a triplet, three lines highlighted in yellow. The first line mentions a method name, the second line mentions a method signature, and the third is a function pointer. This triplet will eventually mean that in the Java world, where this method with this signature exists, link that entry point to this function pointer, to this function in the native library. To uncover these triplets is arbitrarily difficult, and uh, for many cases we can uncover them by reading more parts of the binary and reasoning about consecutive uh, parts in the code and trying to find function uh, pointers. This is not always possible because some binaries are hostile and cannot be analyzed or processed uh, by our technique, but it works for a lot of binaries. This handle of linking is shallow. If a native method in Java calls the native library, then the native library does calls inside the native code and eventually calls back another Java method, we don't form an edge from the start Java method to the final Java method. We could if we would uh, process the call graph from Radar 2, but we're trying to be lightweight, so this case will be missed. Here, this is a knob. You can turn it to make our analysis heavier but more precise for call graph analysis. On the evaluation, the first evaluation is Xcorpus, where the Xcorpus is a suite of Java programs. It gives us a feature report, and the feature report shows all the native methods in these programs. We look at the sources, we find the callbacks, and we verify that all such callbacks are captured by our technique. Our technique detects all callbacks in these benchmarks. These are three benchmarks, not four. The fourth one, log4j, is a benchmark with native code but without native callbacks and serves as a control benchmark. We see here what that when there is native code without callbacks, we don't introduce noise. The second part of our evaluation is about Android applications. And here we examine two big Android applications, Chrome and Instagram. In both of them, we run them and we examine the native callbacks during these runs and we verify that we captured them all. Yes, we do capture them all. There's a 100% recall metric, and we find all native calls in these applications for these runs. A small detail here is that we go to 100%, not from zero, but from some base recall exhibited by the baseline analysis because sometimes a method may be called from other places in the code. So even though it's missed, the native call, the native uh, callback is missed, some other method makes it reachable. And there's also the case that 
maybe it shouldn't be reachable, but analysis of approximation, static analysis of approximation, makes it so. So this is the base recall metric, in case you wondered. Then we build an application. As I said in the introduction, Android application development has a problem with native callbacks. In Android development, you often have to obfuscate or shrink your application so that it can be distributed uh, via the Play Store. And the two most common program optimizers are ProGuard and R8 with some specific syntax. And these optimizers, they make the developer write a manual script, a script that explicitly contains keep rules, as they are called, rules that say do not touch this method because it is a, a callback, because it's from reflection, or all sources of problematic corner cases in the language that a, a tool may not be able to resolve automatically. And each time the developer adds a new native library, they have to update this manual list. Our tool here comes to the rescue and automatically calculates these rules. And as an example here, we have Wikipedia, the application, which gets built and repackaged by following a set of 224 rules. And our tool computes 26 rules. Maybe some rules of ours are uh, overlapping with existing ones. The basic thing to get uh, away from this number is that this is a small part compared to what the total number of rules uh, is. And this technique is available in Dupe and in the Clice Packager. So we saw that strings in JNI binaries are very good for finding callbacks to Java code. They can uncover missed methods in reachability computation, and we can even fix missing edges in call graph analysis in some cases. Real-world programs can be analyzed and 100% success is shown. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. I'm glad to take questions. Thank you, George, uh, for the talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, share on uh, the Slack channel. And I'll start with a couple. And I was thinking also the presentation of uh, the utilities of this and you uh, uh, had a very nice idea about uh, the rules in the end. But uh, what I didn't get in that part was that 224 versus 26. And I understand there would be some other rules uh, that they would want not to be optimized for other reasons. But is uh, did you quantify in some way how many of those 224 rules they originally wrote for the purposes of native callbacks and how many of those were automatically identified. So we can yeah. kind of see that that problem is completely covered or not. Yes, so this is a very interesting question about the numbers. Uh, no, we didn't do the actual uh, cross checking between the two sets of rules. Uh, our basic intuition about that was that our tool does not add a lot of rules the developer already wrote something like 200 something rules, we give the developer 20 something rules. So it's not like we change the workflow much. That was the, the simple uh, thing to get away from this number. I guess our rules uh, overlap some of the original ones, but what we see usually is that because the users have a hard time reasoning about the callbacks from native code, they usually over approximate. So they don't just put a rule for a callback. They say, I know somewhere there, there's a native callbacks happening. So I'll just uh, whitelist the whole package or the whole set of classes. So I think we are more, uh, more precise in the rules, but this is something that we should uh, uh, quantify. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a good point that the users would may over approximate, but an equivalent point would be that your tool is missing some cases and that would identify some areas of improvement. Anyways, I have uh, one more question. Unless there is, please uh, post on Slack if anyone 
as other questions. So I was thinking about your handling of those constructor calls where everything was appearing as unit. And uh, I understand the methods that you have used for to kind of follow from the usage of those instances. And if they make sense, then only follow the constructor calls. But I was thinking, do, would you, uh, would it help to use some binary type analysis to kind of uh, follow the types in the binary code? Would it make sense, something like that in that context or no? Yes. Uh, so we talk about strings that match method names or method uh, signatures, but we ignore strings that match types. Uh, we didn't find anything interesting there. Okay. Maybe it's more common to use uh, strings for method names and signatures than types. Maybe types are a more fluid thing to just uh, consider them very constant. So okay. we didn't, uh, uh, yes. Uh, thanks, uh, George, for the talk and for the very interesting work. And now Thank we you. get to the uh, last talk for the session. And it's an empirical study on um, disassembly and we have uh, uh, we have uh, with us um, Mohoi Jiang who will be presenting live uh, over to you Mohoi. Hello. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna start. Hello everyone. My name is Mu Hui Zhang. I am a PhD student from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Today I will introduce our paper named an empirical study on ARM disassembly tools. This is a joint work with Professor Ya Jingzhou from Zhejiang University. My supervisor, Professor Xia Pu Luo, Professor Ruo Yu Wang from the Arizona State University. Professor Yang Liu from the Nanyang Technological University and Professor Kui Ren from Zhejiang University. According to the statistics, we noticed that embedded devices and the mobile devices are becoming more and more popular. Billions of the devices are sold to customers every year. Among all the devices, ARM is one of the most popular architectures. According to the roadshow from ARM, ARM takes about 90% market share for the controllers of IoT devices and applications processor. And also with the popularity of these devices, the security issue attracted a raising attention. Many news about the security of IoT devices are reported every year. Thus, the security analysis is needed on these devices. However, the anal analysis targets, which are the software of the devices, used to be closed source. This brings challenges to the security analysis. To study the security of these devices, researchers used to utilize dynamic analysis or static analysis. Dynamic analysis is not scalable, while static analysis is still the major mechanism, which requires the accurate disassembly. And researchers used to hold the assumption that reliably disassembly stripped binaries is a solved problem. However, whether this assumption really holds is unknown. Um, previous studies used to target on x86 or x86-64 binaries. However, the findings cannot be applied to ARM binaries as ARM has some specific properties. First, in ARM binaries, inline data is very normal. This brings challenges since disassemblers have to distinguish between data and the code. Second, there are two different kinds of instruction sets in ARM. There are ARM instruction set and the SAM instruction set. For some instruction set, ARM provides some one and some two instruction set, and these two also have the different lengths. It is very normal that one binary can contain mixed instruction set. Thus, disassemblers have to identify the right instruction set. Third, in some one, due to the limited range of branch instruction, combiners will reuse the branch and the link instruction for both function calls and the direct branches. This also brings challenges to disassemblers. Our work makes three contributions. First, we summarize the unique properties of ARM binaries that bring challenges to the disassembly of ARM binaries. Second, we conduct a comprehensive study 
on eight state-of-the-art AMPS disassembly tools. We report our findings to the communities and get the conclusion that reliably disassembly ARM binaries is not yet a solved problem. Finally, we explore the root cause of the failed cases, provide the insights and the future directions for improvements. Now, let's talk about the approach of our study. First, we need to prepare the data set. Thus, we need to combine different, different programs into binaries. Since most of the binaries in the real world do not have debugging information, we need to remove the debugging information to get the stripped binaries. Second, we need to determine the disassembly primitives. With the disassembly primitives and the binaries, we can generate the ground truth in the step three. Meanwhile, we can feed the stripped binaries and the disassembly primitives to different disassembly tools to extract the disassembly results. Finally, we compare the ground truth with the disassembly results to generate the final report on the capabilities of different disassembly tools. I will talk about each step in detail in the following slides. Step one, as I mentioned before, first we need to prepare a data set. To make our study comprehensive, we hope the selected binaries are representative. Thus, we need diverse programs. We select the benchmark program spec CPU 2006, Android Open Source Project and OpenWRT. Android Open Source Project and OpenWT are popular programs in mobile devices and embedded devices, respectively. Besides, we also need to cover the major combiners. We use GCC and Clone to compare our benchmark programs. In addition, different programs will be combined into different binaries with different combining options. We conduct a large survey to understand the combining option and we found O2 and OS are commonly used to optimization flex. We also noticed that some instruction is widely used. Since many companies may obfuscate their binaries before release, we use the OLLVM, which supports three different kinds of obfuscation mechanisms to combine the benchmark programs into obfuscated binaries. Finally, we have 1,800 and uh, 96 binaries, including 248 obfuscating binaries. The second step is about the determination of disassembly primitives. We think instruction and function boundary are fundamental disassembly primitives. This is because the other primitives can be built based on instruction and the function boundary. Here, instruction boundary refers to the start offset and the instruction set while the function boundary refers to the start offset. As for the other primitives, they could be built upon instruction and the function boundary. The third step is to generate ground truth. In general, we generate the ground truth from the debugging information. Specifically, for instruction boundary, we use mapping symbols. As you can see from the figure, ARM um, introduced the mapping symbols to indicate the start address of the code and the data regions. For example, the bytecode starts from offset 0x1000 is ARM instruction set, while, while the bytecode starts from offset 0x2000 is SUM instruction set. We then feed the bytecode with corresponding instruction set to capstone to get the offset for each instruction. For function boundary, the attribute dw at no PC in the dwarf information can tell us the function start address directly. The fourth step is about generating the disassembly results. We select eight tools that are popular and well maintained. Five of them are non-commercial tools, while the left three are commercial tools. And different tools have different methods to extract the disassembly tools to extract the disassembly results. We read the menu of each tool carefully and write a script for each tool to extract the results. Finally, we compare the disassembly results and the ground truth together to generate the report. We use the matrix precision 
recall and the F1 score to evaluate the capabilities of disassemblers. There are well-known metrics in the area of statistics. By analyzing the results, we want to answer four research, research questions. First, we present the evaluation result towards the whole data set. Next, we will explore the factors that can affect the result of the tools. Then we will talk about the influence of the options and the types of tools. Finally, we will discuss the efficiency of the tools. So as you can see, this is the overall result. The commercial tools Hopper and Ida Pro only the highest F1 score in terms of instruction boundary. As for the function boundary, Ida has the highest precision while Hopper has the highest recall. It also means that the function boundary is correlated with the instruction boundary. Apart from this, we noticed that non-commercial tools are not stable. For example, we noticed that more than 600 binaries triggered either an exception or a segment fault of angle. And BAP cannot finish the analysis for 214 binaries within limited time, which is two CPU hours in our experiments. We then analyze the field cases and show some representatives here. As you can see from the figure, tools that only use function signatures to identify function boundary used to make mistakes. For example, BAP utilizes function signatures to detect the function boundaries. It has false positives and false negatives due to incomplete and imprecise function signatures. The second reason is because of the mixed instruction set. The ARM architecture, it is very normal that one binary can have both SUM and ARM instructions. This feature brings challenges to disassemblers. Tools may not be able to accurately identify the instruction mode. The figure shows an example of Hopper. Third, Inline data is very common in ARM binaries. This also brings challenges because tools have to distinguish between data and code. As you can see from the figure, Redial 2 disassembles the inline data at the instruction. Then we will talk about the factors that can influence the result of the tools. First is the instruction set. ARM and the SUM instruction sets are widely used in real world binaries. We noticed that some instruction set brings challenges. Tools used to have lower precision and recall for binaries in some mode. We noticed that the result of the function boundary is worse for some instruction set. We suspect that this is due to the reuse of the BL label instruction. For some instruction set, the range of the B label is limited and the combiners tend to reuse the BL label for a direct branch which is the same with the function call, and this confuses the disassembly tools. As for op optimizations, we noticed that it does not bring significant differences between O2 and OS. This is because that OS flag enables all the optimization flags introduced in the O2 flag. Besides, it includes flags to reduce the padding size, and these flags have little impacts for the disassembly tools. As for the combiners, we noticed that, that combiners do not affect most of the tools, except the Redel2 and BAP. This is mainly due to the function identification method used by them. For the obfuscation, we use OLLVM to compile the spec CPU 2006, and the OLLVM supports three different kinds of obfuscation methods. They are instruction substitution, bogus control flow, and control flow flattening. We found that function boundary is greatly affected by the mechanism control flow flattening. This is because control flow flattening generates a huge number of fake control flows, and they will use BL label instructions in some binaries. This brings challenges to disassemblers. For the third research question, we found that commercial tools are more accurate, robust, and stable. Commercial tools used to have higher precision recall and will not trigger segment fault or exceptions. 
as for the options of the tools, it can also affect the result. For example, enabling indirect jump resolving can improve the result for angle. Option AAA of Radar 2 adopts a more analysis method and can improve the result. As for the efficiency of the tools, we calculate the CPU usage, CPU times, and the memory consumption during the analysis. We noticed that Battery Ninja consumes most CPU resources and memory, which means it supports concurrency will. Well, we also noticed that Gizra consumes most CPU times, which means it is slower compared with the other tools. With the empirical study, we also have some insights. First, ARM is different from x86 or x86-64. For example, inline data is very common in ARM binaries. And uh, there are two different instruction sets in ARM architectures. We also noticed that some tools do not support well for some binaries. Second, we found that tools using function signatures to detect function boundaries can make mistakes. It is rather hard to find the precise function signatures. And also more importantly, the reuse of the BL label instruction brings challenges. As for the usability, we found that non-commercial tools are not robust or scale well. The option of the tools can affect the results or not. Finally, here comes the takeaway. We conduct the first comprehensive study on eight state-of-the-art ARM disassembly tools to locate the instruction and the function boundary. We report the limitation of the tools, explore the root cause, and provide future directions for improvements. We will also release the related scripts and the data in GitHub. Thanks, question and answers. Thank you, uh, Murray, for the presentation. Any questions, please uh, share them on Slack. So, Murray, I have a couple of questions. So, uh, you, you mentioned one of the things that options can improve uh, in the performance of certain tools, especially the non-commercial ones. So mm -hmm. in your takeaway analysis where you uh, did the summary data, uh, no, sorry, not in the takeaway, where you showed the summary performance of uh, commercial and non-commercial tools, uh, you don't have to go to that slide. So okay. did you use the version with the where the options were performing the best or that was just with the default settings and then you later figure out that options can improve oh. upon those oh, okay. results? Okay, uh, actually for the, for the commercial tools like Ada Pro, like Hope, like Battery Ninja, we just use the default settings because we think uh, this is what people used to often, they always use the default settings. But for some of the other uncommercial tools like Radar 2, Radar 2 asks the users to, to specify the analysis commands like AA, AAA and the 4S. So that we, we, we actually, we tested all of them and all of the uh, re results are, in, are shown in the figure. And also as for the angle, angle provides, as you know, angle is a Python library and angle provides different kinds of options for you to analysis the, uh, to, to conduct the analysis. So we enable the, uh, the, the resolving of indirect jump and the disable the resolving of indirect jump. We also uh, uh, test the efficiency for both options. Okay, uh, my, uh, thank you. And my second question is uh, probably beyond the scope of this paper, but I just want your insight on that, that some of the things you identified in the free tools, the non-commercial ones are very difficult to patch, like identification of data as code, that's quite a, uh, would be a lot of work. But there were some things that I felt like would might be uh, minor fixes or quick fixes so are you looking into uh, like patching them or have you tried patching some of them and or, and seen how that affect the result of them uh, in your, you listed two, three points that these are the, we have found the root cause of why those tools were not performing. Yes, actually we did. And this should be our future work. Actually, we use some analysis, like the conflict analysis uh, to, to test whether there are any conflicts 
and uh, the results are pretty good. Uh, running on the spec CPU uh, 2006 and the, the, the accuracy can nearly reach to 100. But that should be another story and we may continue on this road. That is our future work. Okay, uh, thank you Moe, for the wonderful talk and wonderful work. And I would uh, again, thank you our student volunteers, Sifi, Gessi and Fahime Mehman. Uh, thank you both of you. And this uh, concludes the session. I would encourage everybody to, uh, to talk to the authors further about their work in the cloud during the break. And that's the end of the binary analysis session. Thank you everyone for joining.